Hey, what is going on, everybody? And welcome back to the College Info Geek Podcast, the internet's best resource for getting ahead as a student and also the internet's best resource for dressing very, very fashionably. It's just the best one. It is the best one. Check this out. I can't think of a single better example. Yeah. I have to give a shout out to my editor, Tony, for getting me this amazing sweater. Oh, nice. Is that where that it's came from? It's just... Look at this thing. Look at it. People who are not on the YouTube side watching the podcast, they're missing out. Though, they won't miss out because I do have a video coming out which may or may not be live by the time this goes live in which I'm wearing the same sweater. True. You've spoiled the sweater. You've spoiled it. No. It has to be shared with the world in as many places as possible. It's a great sweater. Wrong. Yours is pretty good too. Got some Mario going on. It does have some Mario going on. Yeah. Not a llama. Well, we need to get down to brass tacks, my good friend. Why are they brass? I don't actually know the meaning or origin. I mean, I know the meaning. I don't know the origin of that phrase at all. Me neither. I'm surprised at that. I guess like, I haven't used it enough to bother looking it up. Why not gold tax or platinum tax? Only brass ones? What's up with that? Hmm. Anyway, today we got a five questions episode. This is the second to last episode of the year. Next week, we're doing our yearly year-end recap. I don't even know if we've done that every year. But we've I done it at think least one of them. We did it last year. We did it at least one of so them. So it's now yearly. And I used to do year in review blog posts. So there's definitely precedent to call it yearly. But this week we've got five questions. So for those of you who are possibly new to this podcast, every once in a while, probably every three, four episodes, I'd say, uh, we take five questions from you guys, from the comments on the YouTube channel, from comments on our podcast channel, maybe from comments on my music channel. I don't know. I actually have, I've been getting some questions oh, yeah. from, yeah, from the Why channel. did you make this? Yeah. That, it's terrible. Okay. <laughs> that's not the question. And well, let's it, answer that. <laughs> even if it was, even if it was, why, why do you got to bring that up? Why do you got to do me like that? <laughs> uh, we also take questions from email and Twitter and places like that. I don't check Instagram DMs. I'm very sorry. Instagram now has three DM inboxes. That's true. It's a little there's confusing. Too many, too many inboxes. It's a little confusing. There's primary, there's general, there's requests. Soon they're going to have like desperate request inbox. Mute that one. <laughs> Stand inbox. <laughs> there's going to be like 1,500 inboxes. My tea's gone cold. Mm, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm why. I'm so, well, it's, it is winter. I'm just thinking about Stan. It is winter. Uh, anyway, so yeah, on these episodes, we take five questions from you guys and we answer them in a sort of lightning round style. So we're just going to jump in. But uh, if you would like to have your questions answered on a five questions episode, then put them in the comments on the YouTube video or send us tweets. Uh, I'm Tom Frankly on Twitter and you're Yo Martholomew. Yo. It's true. Yeah. So first question. I recently noticed a pattern that whenever I do something meaningful in any of my personal goals or social life, I feel very excited and accomplished. However, the following workday, I find myself feeling miserable and trapped at a job where my time and energy are being wasted on work I don't value. Is there anything I can do to stop feeling bad during work so I can maintain the momentum of my free time? Or I guess in my free time. Give up. Is that, is that, is that the answer? That's the answer. Second question. <laughs> Um, for me, the answer to this question is, I guess, twofold. Number one, there's an identity issue. So I remember having friends who would just badmouth and disparage their part-time jobs when we were in high school. And, you know, there, it's your standard, like, entry-level part-time job for a teenager. You're working at McDonald's. You're working at a yes, grocery they're store. Like, they're kind of right. It's not great. It's not great, but... My parents always told me that when you go to work, even if it's like a crappy minimum wage job, if it's like the first thing, number one, you're kind of paying your dues. But number two, you go there and you do as good of a job as you can because that's who you are and that's your character. And you're going there and showing what your character is. Mm. So it doesn't really do you any good to badmouth the job. Number one, because badmouthing isn't like no one's going to be like, oh, wait, you didn't like this? Well, well, dang, let me just give you this like $100,000 per year programming job. I didn't know you didn't like pushing carts around a grocery store. Uh, no one's going to do that for you. So you kind of just have to put in your dues. But 
also you're going to be in a better mental space when you're there. If you're like, I'm here and I'm going to work because I have a good work ethic. Um, yeah, I respect my coworkers and I want to show that I'm a hard worker rather than I feel trapped. This sucks. Even if, you know, even if you do, because the fact of the matter is you can start taking steps to get away from it. But while you're there doing your work, you just need to do as good of a job as you can. That's an interesting point, making it more like this is just another chance for you to express who you are Mm -hmm. and, and what kind of person you want to be. And anybody who's going to magically hand you some much better position will need to have already seen that you are the kind of person who wants to do that. But also, yeah, you're being, you're going to be more positive Mm -hmm. because you're focusing more on I'm doing well. Yeah, the work's pointless maybe, but like I am doing well. Yep. Yeah. You're showing up every single day and you're giving 100% because that's who you are. Not because Hmm. that's what the job deserves. Maybe the job does But you would do it at any job. But you would do it at any job because that's who you are. Uh, The other thing I always try to think of is Think of it like an RTS game where there's always a bunch of little things you have to do to gather resources so you can build the big, fun, flashy thing you want to do. Um, like, just let's take Total Annihilation, which is going to show my age because that game is from 1997 or 1998. Oh, but boy. It's still, to this day, my favorite RTS. I mean, hey, I want to build a gigantic battleship carrier, but... To do that, I first need to build a shipyard. And actually, I need to build an advanced shipyard. So I need to build a regular shipyard and then build a construction ship that can build me the advanced shipyard. And to do that, I need to set up solar collectors to get energy and metal extractors to get metal. Those things are boring. But But you get me the resources that I need to do the things I want to do. And I mean, I'll be honest. Like When I had my internship, that's kind of how I had to think. Because there were times when I would I would like look up from my desk and look around the cubicle, poke my head over the cubicle wall and see the endless sea of other cubicles and fluorescent lighting and think like this is a prison and I can't stand it. But that was an interpretation that did nothing but bring me like dread and suck all the joy out of my life. So instead you're I was choosing like, to suffer. Yeah. So instead I was like, you know what? What I really want to do right now is I want to write my next blog post. Well, the money I'm making from this job is enabling me to do that. This is me building the solar collector. Yeah. This is me putting in the stupid metal extractor. It's boring. It sucks. But it's setting up the machinery that I need to do the things I want to do. Yeah. And uh, we did a whole episode on video game terminology, right? Or not terminology, but just like lessons from video games. Yeah, like how... how video games force you to be productive in their own terms, but they're Mm -hmm. very good at making you feel like you've done something useful. Yeah. Even if it's tedious and you're grinding for hours to get experience points. Yeah. So a couple more concepts. I don't know if we talked about these in that episode because that was a while ago. That was a while Uh, ago. One that I think of a lot is APM, which is just actions per minute. Super, super important concept in like MOBAs and uh, and RTS games too. Like, can you set things up faster than your opponent? Yeah. Can you get things rolling faster? Well, I thought about that with my job too. I'm like, well, I'm in this cubicle. No one's really over my shoulder watching exactly what I do every single minute. They're just expecting me to get certain things done. So if I can get those done faster to the same level of quality, I have free time. Yeah. Which is why I spent like a good, probably third of my time during my internship doing my own projects yeah nobody ever got mad i definitely brainstormed stuff like that in, in like boring sections of classes or downtime at work you do it in a notebook nobody's gonna be like you playing around with that notebook <laughs> it's not gonna do anything yeah um oh and then for as far as the momentum thing is this pretty much like it's a very philosophical answer thus far to change your mindset and maybe a direct solution for momentum in the meantime that I just thought of, and I've never tried, so don't don't hate me if it doesn't work very well. But you accomplished something. Maybe you should uh, either write that down or maybe take a voice memo of like what you just did and what the next steps are and what you're excited on to work on next. To mm. and then maybe on your way home from work, right? You just play back that voice memo, or you find a podcast that's motivating to get you back into the mindset. You're, that way, you can use any sort of small commute you might have to erase work yeah from your head 
like be positive and get the most out of your work because really if we're not trying to do the best in most situations you don't know what random person or event might be the key to unlocking something Mm -hmm. so you kind of just should try to do well at most things you can just in case yeah but on the way home you could just find something else that you could listen to that will get you re-amped about your projects as if it had just happened um another thing you can do is if you have any sort of flexibility with your schedule do the personal projects first oh yeah yeah. wake up early or um that's a good point anna has a part-time job now which she kind of got because she wanted it and she wanted to work there but uh she prefers to work the evenings because that lets her wake up do art all day during the early part of the day and then when you go to work there's already enough external pressures and external kind of like controls over what you do there are expectations there's managers all these things so you don't really need to motivate yourself to do the things you do at work you know yeah you just you kind of do it because you have to with your personal projects there's nobody there kind of like hey hey are you practicing piano hmm? yeah, that's so a, that's a lot more self-discipline yeah that's a good point like i will always stay up till like two in the morning if i had to for an assignment or if i have to for work that's due the very next morning mm-hmm. i will do it without question but when it comes to my personal projects there are many times where i'm like it's not a good idea to stay up now i'll stop so it's kind of like, yeah it's the same thing you put you put all the fun stuff ahead you're energized for the day and then who cares if you're not motivated when you're at work you'll probably still do it because they're there yep hmm. all right anything else on that one uh no okay dot com uh, this one this one is hard for me to understand but we're gonna try it anyway my girlfriend and i are both trying to figure out a solution to work together at home on our side projects and freelance work but i find it really difficult to focus and get things done next to the person i love how do you both deal with this and yeah, this one's tough for me because Anna and I just work next to each other all the time. Mm. <laughs> I'm so used to it. Well, <laughs> Ashley and I can't. Although first, I oh, like you can't. I like to think that they put next to the person I love in here, knowing that they listen to this podcast and this is how they're telling them for the first oh. time that they love them. So uh, congratulations. Yes, Samantha. <laughs> she <laughs> boyfriend loved. just wants to get some work done, but he still loves um, you. But yeah, Ashley and I can't actually work very well together. Really? So when we moved to Denver first... We were, in, we were in the one-bedroom apartment. Mm-hmm. We were going to use the dining area as a split office where we both had a desk on each side of the wall. Didn't work at all. Not only because we have basically opposite tastes in decorating, and I need simplicity around me or it's hard for me to think, but I personally cannot focus very well on my own projects if I anticipate that at any moment I might be oh. talked to. Yeah, that's true. If if I even think that somebody might interrupt my focus, I just, I anticipate it and it keeps me from ever getting into focus mm-hmm. to begin with. And I mean, even right now, I basically do my work in the living room and she just leaves a lot. She likes to work in cafes. She likes to work in libraries. She'll work upstairs in her room that is basically an office because she likes to be surrounded by books and things. And I'm just like, I want nothing around me. I yeah. want no people around me. I want everything. I don't want to work outside of the house because I don't like the distraction of being like, I'm thirsty. Yeah. I want one of those things that's in my fridge. I need that. I got to go home now. It messes everything up. And uh, yeah, we, we just have opposite work needs. So mm-hmm. we can't really work next to each other. Yeah. Very well. Hmm. I've had times where Anna and I will be working next to each other and she'll intermittently ask me for feedback or whatever and that will kind of break my focus but i think what i've done is just uh number one my noise canceling headphones those just go on and i'm kind of in my own little world and then if it's to the point where i feel like i'm getting distracted enough i'll just ask her hey can i have like an hour to focus on my stuff with no interruptions yeah you know and that's effectively the same thing as us working separately in a different room but we often will go like to book bar together to do work we just take, sit at the same table yeah so we're we're very used to working huh. next to each other a lot but also i feel like you don't like to go out to coffee shops either i don't, you don't like to work in public places so i think you're a much more solitary person when it comes yeah, to your work. i i can't do like deep work 
mm-hmm. around people. And this was especially true when I was doing a lot of programming because if I'm programming something, I'm working on the, the version of the website that's currently up. When I was doing that, Ashley would come in. She'd have a question. I'd, I'd have my headphones on and everything, but then I'd, I'd see her. I'd take them off, and I would feel confused because mm-hmm. I got so into the programming, I kind of forgot the real world, and now yeah. I'm disoriented. And by the time I've answered any questions, I have no idea what I was doing. It's just nothing at all. It's mm-hmm. completely gone. So, so you got to have that unbroken focus somehow. Yeah, at one point, uh, I got some hue lights, actually, just so that I could be like, <laughs> when this is red, it means I'm programming. Mm-hmm. If it's the other work, maybe. Maybe interrupt me. But if it's programming, please don't yet. Yeah. Alternatively, you set this light to a nice, delightful teal, and it will let me know, ah, oh, she might need me at some point. I'll finish up what I'm doing. It's a little complicated of a system, <laughs> but basically as long as you don't anticipate the interruptions and you've agreed this is how we're going to do it, uh, it's really easier for yeah. me. Well, I've actually heard about a lot of people who work at home doing similar things. There was somebody I know, and I can't remember who it was, who built like a DIY on-air box with a light that was outside their office. Yeah. And it wasn't for when they were like on-air recording. It was just they were working in the zone, so I'm on air. You can't interrupt me. You know. And I remember being a kid, and there were a few times my dad worked at home instead of in an office, and my mom would be like, all right, dad's on a conference call. You have to be utterly quiet for the next like hour. So I think it's it's a lot of communication, and then yeah. just kind of figuring out, like, what's your work style? What's her work style? And does it make sense for you to work in the same room? If not, then don't. Yeah, you know, just be separate while you're working on projects. But I would say if you're going to do that, maybe use the fact that you want to spend time with each other as a limitation on your work, which will help you do that work more efficiently. Yeah, like you've got a schedule. So we're going to hang out at like seven. Mm-hmm. So we have two hours. Yeah. And if I don't finish this, I'm either going to be mad I didn't finish mm-hmm. or ruin that we're hanging out. Yeah. So. Because, I mean, I will, I will be the first to admit that uh, I'm not always the most efficient when I'm working. And that's especially true if I feel I have the whole day to get, like, a couple things done. I will yeah. be 800 pages deep in some forum post about, like, how to set speakers up in a room at the right triangular angles to cut down on, like, wave crosstalk and... <laughs> do I need to do that? Not at all. So yeah. sometimes it's just like, no, you have an hour to do this thing, get it done. If I don't have that, I will dink around. So yeah, maybe use the fact that you want to spend time together as that limitation. Okay. Uh, how can I give feedback to somebody sensitive to criticism? Okay. Well, the, um, there's one thing that Ashley's, uh, I don't know where she heard it. But she mentioned to me once where the idea of like a compliment sandwich Mm. where like you give a compliment, you say something good about the work, then you throw in a criticism, but then you end with another good thing about the work just, just to like sneak in the criticism so that, but they're overwhelmed by the good parts. Then they won't be crushed necessarily. Mm -hmm. Um, I tend personally to use passive voice when criticizing a lot. Oh yeah. Like. Like, I, this was a little yeah, weird like, instead I of think, you did this weird. Uh, I'm, I'm not personally seeing the the cloud texture as much. Mm-hmm. I think maybe because this this color, maybe if it was a little... I'm always talking about the thing itself directly, and I never say, I don't like how you did this. Never bring you into it. That's a bad <laughs> idea. It's it's about the thing. And, and also, like, as I have to art direct a lot of the stuff Ashley does, and I'm helping her with some writing she's doing and her, her various art projects... But it's always, I always got to remember we're on the same team and I need mm-hmm. to communicate that well. It's never like I'm trying to tell you why your things are wrong. It's because I think, yeah. I think that this is going to be great. But maybe if you could try that and just see what happens, I trust your judgment, but this is a thought I have. Mm-hmm. I try to think of what my role is. Like with some people, my role is very complex, like with Anna. I'm simultaneously her boyfriend, friend, art critic, and boss sometimes. And uh, that that can be a lot to navigate. Yeah. With certain people, it's more of a professional relationship, and they want just, like, 
unsugarcoated criticism, just like, tell me what I'm doing wrong. How could I do better? Uh, Tony's like that a lot, where he's just like, I want to do better. So I don't really care. You don't have to sugarcoat a lot. Uh, with certain people, you do. And I like the idea of the compliment sandwich. Yeah. I try to do that a lot. And something about that uh, that I try to think about is it's not really just for people who are sensitive to criticism. Um, I will try to start out feedback with something positive just because a lot of times people don't hear positive feedback about their work ever. Yeah. Yeah, because you wouldn't have felt the need to say it necessarily. Mm -hmm. And what is it? I thought I heard somewhere that it was like, our memories latch on so much to negative things that it's like for every negative thing that is that is said or happens, and it may be interactions in a relationship where I'd heard this, but in general, it takes like three positive things to have as much mm. memory weight. You know, obviously that's not very mathematical, but the concept seems pretty sound. Yeah. If I let my head go to the wrong place, one slightly negative YouTube comment will outweigh yeah, it just cancel, hundreds, it cancels them. hundreds of positive ones. And it's stupid. It's like, you got an A plus on this. You got 99%. Oh, one yeah. person had, and sometimes it's like not even really negative. It's just like, you know, with the last video, most people were like, oh my God, the lighting in this is so good. And then one person was like, the lighting sucks. It looks like you just woke up and filmed this in the middle of the night. And I was, <laughs> and I was like, oh no. I'm like, wait a minute. Well, those are competing what ideas. I think <laughs> about the lighting. I'm really proud of it. So I'm not going to let this, uh, you know, register and hurt me on an emotional level. Well, that's, that's a Sherlock quote. <laughs> <laughs> this mustn't register on an emotional level. But yeah, like if you're in the wrong headspace, one negative comment can just mess up your day. Yeah. And I, I think it's when you're thinking about it as the person giving the feedback, I think you're absolutely right. Like maybe that have a have a higher ratio of positive to, to negative feedback to try to help with that. When you're the person receiving the feedback, um, I'm not really trying to make sure I'm receiving a ratio. I'm more just like, what, you know, what are, what's the mindset I have to put myself in to process this kind of feedback? Yeah. And we had an entire episode about that. Yep. So we can put that in the show notes. I think it's a very good one to listen to. Um, possibly one of my favorites. Cause we don't, we don't get taught how to deal with criticism very often. It leads to a lot of, a lot of issues. Mm hmm. Yeah, and one thing that I, I love to rant about is that um, a lot of younger people have never had to deal with a lot of harsh criticism, at least from authority figures, because there are many systems that have been put into place to ensure that kids always win. Or, oh, yeah. like or, or maybe if you grew up or... with the kind of parent who's like, uh, it's the teacher's fault, yeah. and then like would inter intervene on your behalf, mm -hmm. and then I'd just be like, Mom, no, it was, it was my fault. <laughs> <laughs> I did that. But yeah, yeah, if parents are always intervening and saying, no, you did it right, it's the teacher's fault, or if there's you know competitions or there's no winners and losers, things like that, well, then kids never learn to deal with loss and to deal with a negative outcome or negative criticism. And then when you receive it, Later in life, you're less equipped to deal with it, uh, which is why one of my little tiny tips is play video games on hard. Yeah, that way you can lose more. Just lose yeah. more. Yeah, that get used sense. to it. Just get used to losing. Don't it's get fine. good. Go play <laughs> Stay bad. Sekiro and get stomped. No, it's kind of like how, person. you know, like, um, like kids uh, at, at times, myself included, who like, you know, got good grades for the first little while real easy without trying. And then mm -hmm. eventually there's a point where something happens and you're like, what is, I have to, I try? I have to try? What is this? Yeah. I don't understand. It's like the same thing. You mm -hmm. just, you're not used to it. So it messes everything up. This week's episode of our show is brought to you by our friends over at Skillshare, which is an awesome library full of thousands of courses you can use to boost your skills and your career prospects. Within that library, you're going to find courses on video editing, on graphic design, on Procreate, illustration, pixel art, right? Yep. Pixel art Plenty courses. Of stuff on there. Business courses, web development courses, all kinds of stuff. But the one that I want to promo this week is not yet live if you are listening to this as it goes out on December, what, December 24th, I believe? Maybe 3rd. Or 3rd. Yeah, very close to Christmas, and I will be at home with family when this episode goes live. But in January, very early January 2020, I have a brand new course coming out on Skillshare that will teach you how to build habits and strong routines. So 
If you want to get that course, you want to get my other course, which is already live on how to build a productivity system, how to make sure that your to-do list, your calendar app, your note-taking system, your file organization system all work in harmony. If you want both of those courses, you can get access to them along with Skillshare's entire library for less than 10 bucks a month, which makes Skillshare one of the best deals you're going to find when it comes to learning new things. It's like Netflix, but obviously a lot more useful to your future and your skill development. Uh, and the best part is you can actually get a free two month trial by going over to Skillshare.com slash geek and signing up. So if you sign up today and start the two month trial, you're going to still have that two month trial when my new course launches, which means that you can go and take both of my courses essentially for free. But again, Skillshare's library has thousands of other courses you can use to boost your skills. So it's definitely worth sticking around. So once again, Skillshare.com slash geek to get a two month free trial and to support our show. And big thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this episode. Another big thanks goes out to Brilliant. If you're the kind of person who wants to improve your mastery in math, science, or computer science, Brilliant is definitely something you're going to want to check out. They are a learning platform that has more than 60 in-depth courses, which includes a full math suite. So you can start from the basics of number theory. You can go through algebra, geometry, trigonometry, and get up to the really advanced stuff that even I've never gone through, like differential equations and calculus two and math for quantitative trading and finance. There are statistics and probability courses, which are much more up my alley. I'm much more into stat than I am into calculus, but hey, they have basically all of it. They have science courses ranging from gravitational physics to simpler things like the basics of waves and light and how those things work. Computer science courses like Python programming, uh, the, how algorithms work. They have a new course on search engines. So if you wanna know how Google works, you can basically uh, learn how to build your own mini Google in that course essentially. And the best thing about Brilliance Library is that they take an incredibly active hands-on approach to the learning process. So you're not just gonna be reading through walls of text or watching educational videos. These things are useful, but Brilliant is actually a great complement to them because their courses are really built around problem solving. There are interactive code writing challenges, there's storytelling, there are drag and drop problems, there's all kinds of stuff to really get you very involved in the process of learning these new skills and abilities and concepts, which means that you learn them much more efficiently and much more quickly, and you also stay more interested as you are doing it. So if you want to get started with Brilliant, go over to brilliant.org slash college info geek and sign up. When you sign up, you can start learning for free with their daily challenges feature, which gives you a new challenge every single day from some new area of math and science and computer science. So you can kind of broaden your horizons while also solving a new problem every single day. And if you are one of the first 200 people to sign up with that link, again, brilliant.org slash college info geek, you're going to get 20% off the annual premium subscription, which gets you access to all of those in-depth courses. Once again, big thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this episode, supporting our show, and let's get back into it. So regarding giving feedback and criticism, uh, one last thing that I want to say is if you're going to give criticism, make sure the other person wants it. Because I, I think, you know, we're thinking about this from the perspective of like, oh, the person asked me for feedback. But a lot of times I know that I've been tempted to just give feedback when somebody shows me something and they didn't ask me for criticism. I just kind of yeah. make the assumption they wanted it and that's burned me and them in the past. No, they maybe wanted to be done with it and they were like, I understand it's flawed. I'm going to move on. But look mm -hmm. at this cool thing. And you're like, yeah, but it's way too flawed. <laughs> Bruh. <laughs> Yeah, so try, try to ask yourself, like, why are they showing me this thing? They're not asking for criticism. Maybe they just want to share it with me. Yeah. And they're looking for some admiration, a little bit of acknowledgement of what they did. Uh, they're looking for validation. They're not looking for someone to nitpick it. Yeah. Okay, actually, that, that should apply in many situations because it definitely reminds me of uh, I saw a thing where on Twitter there was there's like a billboard account that just, like, points out when stuff is in the billboard top 200 charts or something mm -hmm. and it like points out one of the one artist got an album back in and somebody's like did we ask you're responding <laughs> to a thing that only does this like clearly they're not asking for criticism they're giving you the results of numbers but there are still people like ew mm -hmm. like what is the criticism not only were they not asking for it but it just doesn't doesn't do anything that's not even yeah work that can be criticized but you could you could publish almost anything online even whether it's relevant or not and then just have a thousand a thousand critiques because you know everybody wants to be mm -hmm. a critic that it's fancy it feels you get a sense of like self-righteousness and like uh 
It is the something. easiest way to make yourself feel good about yourself. It's like I can see stuff that's wrong with that, and therefore I must be better than that. It's just a really negative way to get your own energies up. Yeah. Yeah, there's, a, there's definitely a subset of people that assume they are the intended audience for everything, and when they don't like something, that is because the thing was not made correctly. Yeah. And you know what? Sometimes the thing was not made correctly or could have been made better, but sometimes you're not the intended audience. Yeah. So that's why it doesn't fit for you. Yeah, I've definitely had like <laughs> critiques on my photos that, that I just looked at, and I was like, if you're making that complaint, you must not have scrolled through the entirety of my account, <laughs> yeah. or you would realize that that's almost all I ever do. <laughs> it's like it, like we're cool. I see what you're saying, but it does that critique doesn't make sense here. I'm imagining somebody who just like only likes really happy, bright, colorful movies, like watching Sin City, being like, oh, you know, the this, plot was cool, was too I, dark. I, the, the monochromatic yeah. color profile. I just don't know why they did that. Yeah, like, you know, that's kind of the thing. That's uh, why been bright and colorful. <laughs> anyway, all right, on to the next question. Okay, this one I resonate with. Uh, yeah. As my business grows, I'm finding myself spread too thin and in need of expanding my team. I saw a video of how you use Notion to handle your team and onboarding, and I would love to learn more. Do you have any advice on recruiting a team, what roles and responsibilities to delegate, or any other mistakes or best practices? Yeah, I think we did a really good job with that this year. Yeah, we've uh, upped the delegation quite a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all kind of coming together, too. Because really even if it starts out a little gel. rough, you know, with the, with several people involved, it's like, it, how how do we organize all this? But it's all starting to happen. Yeah. So I, I'm the classic DIYer. So any kind of delegation has been very difficult for me, and it's been sort of like a pulling teeth esque process. But uh, the first delegation experience I had, I think, was with you. Because uh, you had written a couple of articles, and I'm not sure if I would call that real delegation. To me, that just felt like guest blogging. Yeah. But then when you built the website, that was the first bit of delegation. And I was a little bit apprehensive at first, even with that, because I had done all the... I, I guess I had never coded a theme from scratch, but I had done so many tweaks to my theme that I was like, I can do this best. And then you did it, and I realized, wait, no, I couldn't have done that nearly as well as you did at least not in the amount of time I had. So from there, it was just a process of like letting my ego go in many different areas and uh, and letting people take over. Uh, I think the biggest lesson that I've learned when it comes to building and developing a team is that it is actually harder in the beginning to work with a team than it is to work on your own. Because... Most of the time, even if the person you're hiring is very, very talented, if you are hiring them to take over something you used to do, especially if it has any kind of like creativity involved, they aren't going to be able to do it exactly the way that you would have done it. And it's going to be a long process of looking at what they did, trying to give them direction, but also trying to give them some, some like area to grow and do things on their own and be independent and then giving feedback. That's just, it's very tough and it takes a long time. Yeah. Um, and that was a problem that I had for a very long time. I think we kind of skipped it between you and I for the development stuff because you were already so good at web dev and like so far beyond where I was that you were kind of doing something I'd never done before. Yeah. Well, and there was, there was every chance for you to say what you wanted. You know, you gave mm -hmm. me like Photoshop files and it's going to be done how you wanted because you literally said, look at that. And I said, yeah, I'll make that. Yeah. And I guess with, with, done. Our first collaboration, I didn't delegate the design work. Yeah. So I imagine <clears throat> if you would have been designing pages as well. That would have taken would have been, a little longer probably. Would have been a little harder. Um, I think we had a little bit more of it with the podcast editing. And this was so long ago that I I, I, I forgot that I did it. that. But yeah, you did. Wow. So for people who haven't been listening to the podcast for very long, we used to not be a video podcast. And... Uh, my influences when I started podcasting were like the Smart Passive Income podcast, uh, Hello Internet, Cortex, all podcasts that do pretty heavy editing. And it seems kind of silly to me now because we just talk together and we put it online and we make no cuts. But 
when I started podcasting, I would go through the hour or hour and a half of audio sometimes, and I would cut out every pause and every breath noise, and I would try to make it this perfect piece of audio because that's what I thought you had to do. And I guess I was just kind of imitating my idols. And then uh, you had to do that when you started. I spent five and a half hours on one one guest. <laughs> yeah. The problem with editing out vocal pauses when you have guests is that not every guest is used to being on a microphone. Mm-hmm. And therefore, they are way more prone to vocal pauses. Yep. Which is totally fine. But not when you have to cut them out for five and a half hours. That's true. And yeah, I haven't done I spliced an words in a while. together. You couldn't even yeah. tell. I just like. When, when something was repeated, I put them both together as if the error never happened. Mm-hmm. No, I think doing that trained us, or at least me, because I guess you haven't done video editing, but it trained me for video editing because now I'm pretty good at splicing takes together when I screw up a line in the middle of the line and then don't remember oh, yeah. where I screwed up. I'll often start over again. And I'm like, well, the beginning of this line wasn't as good as the previous take, but then the rest of it was. So I'll just split them in the middle and it's all good. There have been times where I've taken the video for one take and the audio for another take. And if you were to look super closely, you could see a mismatch. Um, There have been times where I've misspoken a word. So I'll do another take just speaking the word correctly, but then I'll just, I'll splice the word into the original (laughs) video. (laughs) So yeah, if you were looking super close, you could see, Uh, but that was very good training. But yeah, I guess the main point here is if you're going to hire a team, you need to prepare yourself for a not insignificant amount of time where you're actually working harder trying to teach them. And a really hard lesson I had to learn is you have to teach them. You have to give the feedback. It's so tempting each and every time to take what they give you and be like, okay, thanks. I'll take it from here. And then you go and do all the tweaks and get it to exactly how you want it. But now you're, you're just adding onto the work pile. They've spent X amount of hours editing it. And now you're spending another two hours editing it. And they're not learning. Yeah, you've just wasted your own time and you're not helping them to save more of your future time. Mm -hmm. And I feel like there's got to be a bit of humility to this sort of thing too. Oh, yeah. Because in the end, like, in my opinion, the best goal is that anybody you train, you want them to become better than you at what you're high. You want to be like, how did you, I don't know that anymore. Mm -hmm. You've surpassed me. Because if you're trying to be the smartest person in the room, well... What, why are you just hiring only people that will never do better than you could have done yourself? I realize saving time, but at some yeah. point, if they surpass you, that's a good thing. And you have to be willing to accept that mm-hmm. without feeling like, oh, no, I'm not good at anything anymore. I need to fire them. Yeah, there's so there's a, there's a well-functioning team, but that doesn't always happen. What you sometimes get is the genius with a thousand helpers model where... You get one person who kind of built something on their own, but they're so unwilling to let it go. And they're so, they need to micromanage everything that everyone under them is never empowered to develop and make things on their own. Yeah. And, and then uh, they'll be less motivated without you don't want being to be that. empowered. Mm-hmm. They'll do better work. Um, and yeah, there, I mean, there have been times where like, especially recently, because Tony's really coming into his own where he'll edit something and I'm like, that's awesome. <laughs> I remember thinking the the intro that he put together for the dual monitor video was super tight. And then the one that you guys made together on the most recent video, the 1% rule. Oh, that. I wasn't a part of that. I think I maybe suggested, hey, go brush your teeth with a hairdryer. That's, well, that's the kind of thinking we need. <laughs> exactly the kind of... This is, yeah, the exact type the world. of high-level thinking we need. But that was all I had. I had nothing else to do with it. You guys filmed everything, <laughs> you acted it out, Tony put it together, and then Ann and I watched it together and we were like, this is amazing. I love this. <laughs> the boss yeah. wants me to brush my teeth with a hairdryer. <laughs> I don't know. I'll do it. <laughs> it's the assignment for today. <laughs> um, so when it comes to giving feedback, one thing that I would do with Tony is he would edit a draft and then he uploads it to a tool called frame.io where I can watch through the video and I can add comments that are time stamped. So... I'll watch through his drafts and I will, you know, be like, all right, uh, change the line height on this text. It's too big or something like that. Um, But when I get to a point where I need to go in and make tweaks myself, what I'll do is either screen record myself doing it or uh, I use a screenshotting program called GreenShot where I can take a screenshot of what he did and then I'll paste that into Notion. And I love GreenShot because it will automatically put your screenshot onto your clipboard 
And then I can, so I can just take the screenshot immediately, command V it into Notion. And then I will do my changes and I'll screenshot it again and I'll put that into the Notion right below it. So on each video project, I usually have like an editor feedback section where it's like, all right, here's what you did. And then here's what I did. These are the changes and here's why I made them. Because that gives him a, a way to compare. It's a good idea to screenshot or screen record that just so it's super yeah. easy. You're not even needing to spend any more time teaching. You just... Mm -hmm. hmm. And sometimes I do have to teach. Like I'm like, all right, well, here's why I want you to extend this B-roll clip a few more seconds. Normally in B-roll, if we're moving from one idea to the next idea in the A-roll, we would cut. But the next idea that we're talking about, we don't have B-roll for it. It's just me talking, so there's no we don't really need to cut back to my face, especially since this B-roll like has a lot of details, so let's just let it play out so people can look at it. Hmm. Like there's certain things where you're kind of trying to teach the artistry. And a lot of people will say, like, oh well, artistry, you can't teach it. Like you can't teach taste. But I think you can. When you tell people the reasons, especially when you can identify them, here's why my taste would prefer this version over this version, then they start to develop their own taste as well. Well, I'm not even, I'm not sure I understand the argument that you can't teach taste because I used to eat nothing but meat, bread, and potatoes, and now I'm just super excited about mm. all the weirdest foods I never would have thought to, to do. I can recognize the tastes and yeah. like you just becoming knowledgeable about something helps you develop taste. Yeah. Yeah. There might be elements of artistry that you can't teach very well, but I think that when people say things like you can't teach taste or you can't teach improv or whatever that is, they are going way beyond what is actually ineffable and unteachable when they make these statements. I think you can teach a lot more than people assume. Yeah. It's, it's like, I probably can't teach somebody to become Da Vinci in a month. Mm -hmm. That'll take some time. Likely not possible. Yeah. But I bet they could delve right into something pretty deeply and come out way smarter about it than they were before. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, at some point, you know, if, if there are more questions, um, we could do an entire episode or something on building a team. Cause it's, it's definitely been one of the biggest challenges that we've had to face as a company, but it's also been one of the most beneficial things we've done. Yeah. So, which that's, that's nice, you know, to see the, the input effort, yeah. results in output. It's not just like floundering about wondering why we tried. Mm -hmm. I will I will mention one last thing is um, I've had to come to terms with what my role is because as the company has grown, I found myself being the creative head because I'm the face of the videos, but also still being the business head. And that doesn't always work. Like I want to be the creative head. And really the only reason that I'm doing the business things is because I feel a need to control everything, but I'm not uniquely suited to doing those things. I'm not the only person who can log into Amazon Associates and see how much money we made this month and put that in a spreadsheet. Yeah. So one thing that I've had to do recently is come to terms with giving up some of the CEO stuff. And uh, I've, you know, read some stuff by some pretty successful entrepreneurs and talked to other entrepreneurs I know. And that's kind of part of the growth process is just sort of learning that like, oh, you built this, but you're not actually the CEO type. You're a creator. So hand the reins over to a CEO and let them do it better for you. Yeah. You know, that's okay. I think there was a book we reviewed on the podcast once that talked about that concept. Was it good to great? Might have been. Yeah, it might have been good to Something great. that talked about types of leaders or something. Like level five leadership? Yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah, that was the good to great episode. Oh, okay. Because, yeah, I was talking about how, at least in the yeah. good to great study, they had determined that the you know the, the best types of CEOs weren't the super flashy, bombastic, visionary types. They were just like the sort of humble, head down, get results, empower people yeah. kind of people. And that's not always the artist who makes things. So if you're the artist who makes things and you find yourself at the helm of a giant business empire, maybe hand the helm to somebody else who's more equipped to handle it. Uh, okay, so last question. I don't know how to relax. As a productive person, I find breaks very useless, and it drains me. People have told me to travel, but it hasn't helped. So how can I find hobbies or other things to help me wind down when I'm not doing productive things? Well, um, this is a mood. Yeah, I feel it. It's a it's a real thing. 
I will say that the very the hobbies that usually mean the most to me that make me feel driven to do them are the hobbies that involve creation. Mm. So I can get pretty sick of video games after a while. Yeah. And like, so I'm trying to foolishly hatch a shiny Pokemon, and I know that's going to take forever, and I'm mostly riding in a circle. So if I do that for longer than 10 minutes, I start to like feel like I'm imprisoning myself, mm-hmm. and I just hate it. So I, I understand. I just want to do something. But the hobbies I have that are art or creative-based, even if it's creative cooking, uh, the pixel art that I started doing, photography, anything, or music, anything like that, that doesn't feel the same to me. I'm never like, I'm imprisoning myself by playing piano. I just, I lose track of everything and play piano. I think mm. art is a good place to start if you're looking for something. Yeah. Yeah, art's a big one Like, for it me. feels productive, even if it's, like, not strictly productive. I wonder, I just had this thought pop into my head, so I don't know if it's anything good, but... Is relaxation something you can practice? I mean, maybe you just maybe it's just about practicing disconnecting from something and lowering the level of anxiety you feel. Mm-hmm. Because maybe it's like if I'm not doing something productive at all times, I'm not controlling enough of the output of my life. Maybe you just need to let go. Yeah. And sometimes you can't control it, so just sit back and do something else. Mm-hmm. And it's really hard to let go of that when you're driven. Yeah. What if you kept the journal on the days you were super productive all day long, and then you also did that on days where you scheduled a break time, and then you came back after a while and compared the amount you accomplished between both? Because I would assume that if you had at least a small break scheduled, so you're not you know saying like I'm going to take the entire day off and only work two hours, but you work a normal amount of you know hours and you give yourself like an hour or two just to relax, I would assume you would get the same amount done. Yeah, and that's coming from my own experience. Because I know if I if I'm like I'm just gonna crush it the entire day. Some days I will. Some days, I'm just kind of kidding myself. Yeah, and and setting that scheduled break is also going to be helpful because if you have specifically, what do I do today to succeed? Or like I'm gonna work this many hours. I'm done at six. Or I'm gonna get this thing done. I'm done when it's done. Because if if I personally don't do those things then even after I've worked a long amount of hours, if I overestimated what I was going to get done that day, I will kind of feel like, no, but there's so much work to do. There's no way I could do something else. I'm I'm overwhelmed. I'm swamped. I'm treading water. I can't stop working. I have to. But when I've told myself, well, actually, your definition of work today is to accomplish these three things, uh, assuming maybe you do a bit of a re-estimation near the end of the day if it it looks like they're going to take longer, but otherwise you're done at six. You quit working. And then that's the only way for me to disconnect. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, well, especially with this job and increasingly with many other jobs now that you're expected to answer email and phones and things. But, like, we literally could work 24-7. Yeah, sometimes we do. And be doing things. Yeah, we just work work all day long and it doesn't – and it's going to be productive. It will do more things. Mm -hmm. So if we aren't very careful, then we're going to get overwhelmed at some point if we're not now. I'm starting to convince myself that relaxation is a skill that you must practice. So here's my justification. We can become addicted to social media or it can become like a habitual pattern of behavior, right? You log into Instagram and you're rewarded with likes on your photos, with comments and with an ever refreshing feed of new content to look at. So that becomes a pattern of behavior. I want some neural stimulation and I want some uh, adoration from other people. Well, I can get that by going to Instagram. And for really ambitious people, I think being productive can do sort of the same thing. It's healthier as long as you don't go too far with it. But if you're just like one of the kind of people who's like, all right, I'm going to put in so much work. I'm going to get all these things done. I'm going to publish a blog post. I'm going to get a YouTube video out. Well, the result of your labors is a reward. And if you're the kind of person who's wired to keep chasing whatever it is you want to go for and you're willing to put in all that kind of work, that becomes a pattern of behavior as well. So perhaps like meditation is the antidote to a distracted mind that is constantly seeking um, you know, more stimulation, perhaps just relaxation is the antidote 
to overwork and over hustling, I suppose. Yeah, you're kind of running off that accomplishment high. Yeah. It does you feel just good to finish, it. finish things. I can't, you know, it feels great. Mm-hmm. You're like, I'm in control of my destiny. And I don't know about the person asking this question, but I know my brain, my brain loves seeing numbers going up. So some of my time spent quote unquote working is me logging into Ahrefs to look at Google rankings and me logging into the Instagram analytics. Feed of business. It basically is the Instagram feed of business. I'm working right now because I'm looking at the watch time percentage comparison page between this video and my last video to see if I did any better. That's work. Well, sure, maybe I'm going to gain an insight that will allow me to do better work, but I'm also stimulating my brain with statistics and calling it progress. Yeah. Uh, and to anybody who's ever played cookie clicker or paperclip maximizer, uh, you will know this. The numbers keep going up uh, and eventually your brain becomes numb to the actual numbers and only seeks the change in numbers. And there's there's no end. You know, you can yeah. make $1,000 a month and be really happy with it. You can make $100,000 a month and be really happy with it. Uh, but you could make both of those numbers and be really dissatisfied with it as well or really bored with it, at a certain point, your brain won't care. Yeah. Same with any statistic. The hedonic treadmill is tricky. Mm -hmm. So be ambitious, hustle, do all those things, but maybe practice real uh, relaxation. I remember being that person in college, and I hated relaxation, and I still hate sleep. Oh, yeah, you did do that. We made fun of you for it. Mm -hmm. It's like Tom's over there working. (laughs) We're going to play Monster Hunter. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) But you know what? I remember you guys making fun of me and I was like, yeah, I'm going to work. But I spent a lot of that summer not really being that efficient. Looking at stats, reading yet another productivity article or an article about how you need to change the color of the opt-in buttons on your blog because I did this this study with a sample size of four people and it turns out the purple button works better than the red one. So blah, blah, blah. (laughs) It's not really work. Yeah. So... I don't, perhaps practicing rela- relaxation would also help you to gain proper perspective about what is important in your work and what is just mindless, like hustling for hustling's sake. Yeah. Well, and I, I think part of the, yeah, like getting used to relaxation, depending on what activities you might relax with, you may be teaching yourself simply to wait for that, for that little bit of dopamine, you know, because it's mm-hmm. going to take a little bit for you to get into some of these activities. Yeah. Um, exercising takes a bit to feel good instruments take a bit for you to do anything that feels rewarding and you need but you're not getting the instant feedback that like social media or your statistics would do yep but eventually it will give you something Mm -hmm. you just need to do the what's that called where you have to push off your reward there's a name for it Uh, there was like an experiment with kids in marshmallows delaying gratification that's it that's it right there i remembered kids and marshmallows first Mm. i don't know why but yeah you need to learn to get more delayed gratification because these things will bring potentially much more gratification you just they're not going to seem as immediately rewarding that's the difficult part yeah you're you're trained for immediate answers Mm -hmm. and you need to learn patience for those things yeah and i guess a lot of what i said is uh reflection on my own development as a person so yeah like you've you've anybody, definitely done this anybody listening to this don't you know i'm not saying that you are overly obsessed with numbers i'm just saying i have been overly obsessed with numbers in the past and called it work yeah uh, and it's it's not you know so practice yeah. relaxation and i think that's it oh i mentioned the hedonic treadmill uh oh. we have an episode on that we so, do have an episode on that you know if that sounds mysterious and interesting I'm not going to spoil it now. <laughs> um, Probably a good episode. We have so many episodes now that I don't remember the episode number. I'll just, that one. just guess a number. 263. I have no idea. It's probably not that. I'm, that's probably a good one, though. But what if it is? Yeah, that's probably a good episode. It, it could be that one. I don't know I'm, what it is. I'm, I'm going to look it up. But uh, this is episode 284. And if you want to go to the show notes page, which you can find over at cigpodcast.com slash 284, you'll find the show notes, which will link to all of the episodes we mentioned in this episode. So if you want to go check out the Hedonic Treadmill episode or the one about taking criticism or anything else we talked about, it'll be in there. I don't know if, I don't know if we talked about another one. It might've been just those two. I don't know. Well, I'm gonna assume it was just those two. Uh, or you can go over to cigpodcast.com, no trailing slashes, no numbers, no nothing. I was wrong. What was it? 
Are We the Loneliest Generation? Oh, that one. That's not the same episode. That's I'm a good sorry. one, though. I'm sorry, guys. That's a good one. Uh, CIGpodcast.com to learn how to subscribe to the podcast. We'll have links for Spotify, YouTube, if you want to watch the podcast and see our amazing Christmas sweaters. What? Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, all the podcasts. So if you want to get our episodes delivered to an app on your phone or your iPad or whatever every single time we release an episode, you can subscribe. Otherwise, you can just, I don't know, keep listening through like Forest Echoes. Yeah. Because we definitely do broadcast these as Forest Echoes. I've got like several that radio That sounds pretty on brand for me. Just so, uh, out in the forest somewhere and just broadcasts our episodes all day, every single day. Um, Yeah. I think that's it. What else do I do in my end spiel? Um, stay cute. Stay cute. Yeah. Oh, if you want to, you can go on Apple Podcasts and review this podcast, give it a rating. Um, I've been told that helps bump it up the rankings, but really... I just like seeing reviews. We love seeing what you guys think of the podcast. So if you want to do that, uh, that's always appreciated. But we also just appreciate the fact that you're hanging out and listening to the show. And uh, we will see you in the next episode, which is actually next week. So thank you.